Police reporting is a great way to get uh, engaged in your community and get some terrific stories. So let's see how to do it. Um, I think this is the best beat in the business, to be honest with you. It offers tremendous stories. Um, there's, there's everything that you need. It's got the protagonist, the antagonist. There's heroes, there's scoundrels, there's controversy. Um, you know, Edna Buchanan, she covered uh, the crime beat for the Miami Herald for a long time. Um, she's since passed away. But she said that the crime beat has it all. Greed, sex, violence, comedy, and tragedy. You know, it attracts and repels readers, crime, because um, it's, it's scary when it hits close to home. So people want to know, um, but yet they're a little unnerved by it. So you, you focus too much on the crime aspect of it. You can be sensationalistic. You can alienate readers. Every newsroom is going to decide what its own threshold is, but you need to think about how you can balance covering crime with other aspects of public safety because there's more to public safety than just crime. Now, when you are covering crime, though, it's it's always deadline writing. Um, it's very demanding, very stressful. Uh, it takes a lot of time and patience to get the trust of, of the police. Um, I don't think the police start out being uh, overly trustful, um, and they have a job to do. So, you know, we have to figure out how we can build relationships with them. It's a give and a take. So the more that you can show them that you treat what they do with respect, hopefully the more they'll treat you with respect. It's also important that we know the Sunshine Law. So, you know, the open record law of uh, the public records are open to people, and police records are a very important part of the open record reporting that we'll do. Um, in fact, we will be checking the crime log from Ohio State Police. We'll be seeing exactly uh, what's going on on campus, getting more information from that. All that is public information, including the names of the people who both commit crimes and are the victims of crimes. Now, ethically speaking, we have to decide what we do with those names once we receive them, but they are public information. Minors would be the one exception. Okay, so any adult who's arrested is going to have a public record. Juvenile records are usually not available. Again, national security is something that will be claimed if something's going to be held. So I really encourage you to think about covering the Ohio State police beat. Um, go out and visit the police station or the precinct house uh, in your area. But here we have a police station over Blankenship Hall. You know, meet them face to face. Get to know everybody, the people in the records room, the patrol officers, the chief, the deputy chief, the captains, uh, you know, the people who are cleaning up around there. Everybody has information for you and everyone could be a source. Be very polite and courteous, um, but don't be intimidated by them. They have a job to do. You have a job to do. And, you know, the ability to work together is going to be a big part of um, serving the informational needs of our public. Um, the police log is something that we would check weekly or daily. It shows all the arrests, usually in either a 12 or 24 hour cycle. Um, so you're going to look and see if there's anything interesting, you know, was something really quirky stolen or um, was there a violent crime of some sort that we need to be reporting on. Now at Ohio State, we get crime alerts, but we don't get them for everything. And that's really a subjective um, kind of uh, pursuit that, that the, uh, the police department does as it, it fits within something called the Cleary Act. Um, so we can't guarantee that just because we don't see an alert that something important didn't happen. This is what an arrest report is going to look like. Uh, it's documents that the police fill out when they make an arrest. So you want to ask about getting a copy of the police report. It'll save you and the police a lot of time explaining things. Um, you know, a lot of times there's a, a scanner app that you can do. Uh, you you want to get to know everyone on your beat. You want to be able to use that scanner app. Um, get familiar with the procedures, with the shift changes, with, you know, how and why they do things. Go on a ride along with the police. You know, get to know them personally. Start to think, though, in terms of trends and statistics, not just the one-off of a particular crime. So, you know, when you're looking through that police log, if you see, wow, there's like, you know, a ton of bicycles stolen this week. Let's look at what that means and maybe some preventative measures that the police might be able to mention. Um, get the words, though. you got to interview police officers about the crime that you're covering. Um, you know, talk to victims as well as police. Talk to witnesses when you're out on a, on a scene. Uh, it's imperative that you get real voices in here. And remember that accuracy here is critical because we really can straddle a very dangerous libel line. If you're going to accuse people of crimes or say that they've been charged or convicted when they haven't been, just because someone's arrested certainly doesn't mean that they're charged and many people who are arrested are never charged. So you want to make sure that you are very clear about the nature of the arrest, the details of the subject, uh, of the suspect. Make sure you have their name correct, get a name, middle initial, uh, get their birth date, a location so that you can make sure if you're publishing about it, there's a lot of John Smiths in the world and if you you may have the wrong one. So you want to make sure that you're as accurate as possible. 
Um, some people are bigger crime stories than others, right? So when Maurice Claret unfortunately steals cell phones, that's a huge story where there's probably a cell phone stolen every day. Um, you know, be very careful with, with certain things. Uh, confessions are notoriously um, suspect. Um, you know, even eyewitness accounts are a little bit difficult. So we need to be look at them with a very critical eye. You know, be very careful about what you put in your stories in terms of minors or sensitive crimes, especially sex crimes, um, victims who may be endangered, like, uh, you know, women in spousal abuse situations, um, and stereotyping people. So we have to be very conscious of treating people with respect, especially on this beat, uh, but really on every beat. Now, when you're dealing with a victim, you want to make sure you identify yourself, tell them you're a reporter, say, you know, I know this is a difficult time. I'd like to speak with you. Um, you know, emphasize uh, that you're, you're going to go slow, but you have to be very careful what you say. So don't say, like, I know how you feel or it could have been worse. Um, active listening is a great practice here. I hear you saying this. Um, I hear, you know, so you can repeat back what they've said to make sure you have it correct, and that can be your interaction. Um, but, you know, this is it's, it's a very challenging part of your job. Um, it's, it's something that you're going to be uncomfortable doing as you get started talking to people who are victims or survivors, um, but it's a really important part of your job, too. So for crime writing, you're looking to add color, not clutter. So you don't want to put perpetrator and, you know, different cops speak. Um, you know, avoid these kind of sloppy allegations, um, you know, worrying innocent until proven guilty, et cetera, things like that. Um, remember, people are not arrested for the crime. They're arrested and charged with the crime. Um, so anything that, that you say is going to be very specific. Um, and then this idea of the chronology, we've talked about that martini glass of writing. Crime writing really lends itself to that, or police writing in general, the chronology of how something took place. <laughs>